Okay, everyone, welcome back. Season two, episode five. My name is Ian Fraser. Matt Boyce. Mike Marisevich. And the guests are continuing to get better and better. Season one, we, we had some great guests and some people who were really you know, near and dear to us in, in the industry. And season two has, has kind of built on that. I would agree. Yeah, definitely. Some people outside of our network, I would yep. say, in season two, which is great. I think we're having a lot of conversations with people that we haven't even talked to before yeah. or maybe just had a little bit of touch with online. So yeah, this is going to be a great episode. I know. No, excited uh, about it. I mean, Mike sent me sort of some notes prior to, to this one and even just looking through the achievements. Mm. We have Simon Dyson with us today, six-time European Tour winner, um, a real sort of familiar face. I mean, yep. you know, the, the sort of style the, the, the kind of style the blonde hair there's the character he's got a big yeah. personality simon he does he's very memorable right i mean i think uh, I, I definitely watched quite a bit of tour or european tour golf um when i was younger and he was one that i always remember kind of he's always up there right yeah. like he's just a very sort of solid player so i think one thing we uh you watch like footage from him and he is very colorful back in the day like he was the first to kind of wear g4 stuff and yeah. i think he was wearing some some crazy patterns so um, he's definitely a, an interesting guy. Yeah, I mean, you, you do your research on on Simon, and, and he does. He pops up in, in you know the the GQ yeah, edition yeah. for golf yeah, and true. things like that. He was one of those guys. Always wore the white pants. Yes, yes, loved yes. the colors. <laughs> Very uh, snappy dresser. So I, I'm I'm really I'm really interested to get into this because. For him now, it's not about being a tour player. Yeah, he's had a very interesting shift. He's he's very much um, on the coaching side, sort of the performance um, kind of category of golf. Mm -hmm. um, I really noticed him popping up on on social media, very active on Instagram now. Doing doing brilliant with that. Yeah, stuff. Doing really really well. So, and I think that's kind of how we both came across each other and decided this would be a great um, yeah. podcast to do. That's it. All right. Well, let's let's not delay. Let's yeah. get the man in. Okay, guys. Delighted to be joined by Mr. Simon Dyson. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thanks. Thanks for having me. Not at all, not at all. Great, yeah. I mean, uh, I think with, with the kind of challenges we're all facing um, in our day-to-day -day lives, this is, this is you know, a real, a real kind of benefit and plus of, of that situation. And we're, we're really glad to have some time with you, Simon. Yeah, it's given a lot of people a lot of time to kind of connect with each other, hasn't it? And I think yeah. it's, it's something that doesn't happen enough in my eyes, in my opinion. You know, yeah. we're all in this sport together and you know, we should connect a little bit more and it's given us the time to do that. So hopefully this is a turning point. I think you're a hundred percent right. I mean, golf has, has been, it's got to be one of the leading sports when it comes to um, sort of online interaction, even prior to this, yes. but now, now look at it, it's exploded. It has exploded. The number of times I open my phone now on Instagram or YouTube and see so-and-so is live. Yeah. So-and-so is live with another person. I know. It's great. I mean, I, I have spent, I mean, it's, you got time to kill. I spent hours watching interviews and yeah. stuff like this just because you're right. These people normally don't get together kind of conversations here and there, but not public yeah. facing. So it's to everyone's benefit. I spend hours trying to figure out Simon's dissolution questions. I know. I know. How good I are know. they? Are you enjoying <laughs> them? <laughs> so good. I'm loving them. Yeah, they're great. I'm absolutely <laughs> loving them. I have to listen to them about three or four times. Oh, geez, what does that mean? <laughs> one, of the, one of the guys from Puma came up with that. He said, I, I did my first one and he said to me, if you don't call these the desolation teasers, I'll be very upset. So that's why I call them that, but it was pretty it. cool. Top, man. Well, um, Simon, maybe just let's, let's take a little step back and, you know, talk about your early days in golf. And, and prior to this, all the success you had, let's talk about sort of the amateur days and, and sort of maybe even a little bit of the Walker Cup and take us through that and, you know, how you got to where you are today. Yeah, it was... I always say there's a moment in your early career where, you know, when you just have to ride that wave, you get that little break, mm -hmm. which I got in the English amateur uh, in Hoylake. And mm. the kid had a three foot putt to knock me out in the first round. Wow. And he missed it. And then I beat him down the second extra playoff hole and I got to the semis. And it's the mm. first time... England had really kind of taken a note of what I was mm -hmm. doing. Even though I've been playing for Yorkshire, my county, for yep. a good few years, it was the first time where I got approached and then they were like, right, we've seen what you're doing, did really well this week. I want you to go, we want you to go to Greece to play in the Greek amateur. So I went representing England and I finished second behind mm -hmm. Henrik Stenson. 
Jeez. Not the first time that's happened, by the way. <laughs> well, it was the first time, but certainly not the last. Not the last. Um, so again, so all of a sudden I got a little step up again. Then I went to the Sherry Cup, which is an amateur event in Spain mm-hmm. to represent England. And I finished third. So all of a sudden, by that very fortunate break that I got on the first, I kind of rode that wave. Right. And then I got picked for my first England cap and I was unbeaten for England. So <laughs> it, was, it was pretty hard to drop me, really. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. And obviously, the, the, the sort of coronation of any amateur, you know, for when you come from Britain is, is to get a, a Walker Cup cap. Absolutely. That was my holy grail as an yeah. amateur. I worked hard for that. I got offered scholarships in America to go to college and I turned them down because I thought my best chance of playing in the Walker Cup would be to stay in the UK and play in all the big events, Brabazon, British Amateur, Lytham, mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. And, and that was a heck of a team uh, that year that, that you guys had. I mean, I remember that. I was, I, I was fairly new to golf when, when you guys were on that team and, uh, but you know, those names and, and how well everyone's yeah. done, Casey and obviously Graham Storm. And, you know, there's on both sides, there was lots of names uh, that have turned out to be great players. There was loads of names. I mean, at one point, our 10-man team, every single player had either a European tour card or a US PGA card. Wow. wow. Uh, like, I think it was maybe 2002, 2003, all 10 players had one. But like you say, I mean... There were some really good American players, but a funny story, we were at the dinner and I'm chatting to, you'll have to remind me of his name, I can't remember it, but as soon as I finish the story, you'll know it. Yeah. I'm sat next to this lad chatting away, so I said to him, you know, is this your first time playing in the Walker Cup? He says, yeah. I says, oh, what results have you had? Any good ones? He said, yeah, I, um, I got beat in the final of the US Amateur. So I said, oh, Ripping great effort that. I said, I only really remember one US amateur. It's the one where Tiger was like eight down. He went, Yeah, that was where that was the one against me. That was oh, me. No. <laughs> I just looked at him, I just went, I'm so sorry. He's like, it's fine. I'm gonna be the best player that's ever lived. I can handle it. <laughs> I can't amazing. remember his name though. I'm blanking too. I know. I know. I can picture him. I, I can can't. I can see it as well. Yeah. I can see that as well. Yeah. Anyway. That's, well, that's, a, a, that's a pretty cool story. <laughs> so um, from from Walker Cup, you were over to Asia, um, started your career playing out there and had some good success, out, really good success out there. I mean, I've got to be honest, it was one of the best best years of my life, I've got to, I've got to say. I, uh, my coach, Pete Cowan, I'm, a lot of guys have heard of him, he got me a sponsorship together. I was just going to stay in the UK and play a little bit of regional stuff. And he said, no, I've got you a sponsor. You're going to go and try and play in Asia. So I was like, I knew where Asia was. It's miles away. I'd, you know, I'd been to South Africa, but apart from that, I'd never been out of Europe. So 10 of us went to Asia and I was the only one to get through the first stage. So uh, they all left. So all of a sudden I'm there on my own and I got through second, got through and then to finals and finished second in the final stage, which then got me an invite to play in the Malaysian Open, which was a European tour event. So that was my first event as a pro which was quite surreal really yeah from playing Amazing. all of a sudden like Podrick Harrington's there and mm-hmm. people like that Lee Westwood and you're like looking thinking I can't believe I'm playing against these mm. guys yeah, yeah exactly I mean they were huge names and, and those co-sanctioned events are huge in the European mm. tour I mean they're, they're huge opportunities for for players who are doing well and on you know whether it be the Sunshine Tour or over in the Asian Tour and things like that yeah they're, they're really good opportunities the They've thought that out really good. I mean, a lot of the players love playing them as well because it's totally yeah. different. You go to Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Philippines, you know, China, places like that. It's so different. The culture's so very different. So, the, but all the players love playing them. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, you've seen that, especially, you know, four or five years back. And a lot of those players who, were, who do well always in those co sanctioned events, they, they were starting to rack up a a ton yeah. of money. It's true. Um, there's guys who just put so well in those grainy greens and in those yeah. hot, humid conditions, and because it's not what it's not what we're, you're used to. It's a very uni- those have to be very unique events, I guess. And then if your game suits it, you can really do well in them. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you go to some of those courses and the grass is just totally different. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a, we used to play a tournament in India and, uh, no, Thailand, and there was a guy called Willachant. Mm-hmm. Can't think of his first name. He just used to chip, like he, like, you know, like he was throwing the ball out. You know, he, he practiced it so hard and his short game was unbelievable out of this rough. And you used to think, what's he doing there? I was, but he just spent hours at it, but. Yeah, they were they were really good getting all, you know, different uh, regions and countries together. Really good. I enjoyed them. So pretty quickly, you made your way onto the big stage. You, you got your, your European European tour card, and and you know pretty quickly you you kind of got yourself in, in a good spot. You you owned the Dutch Open for the yeah, KLM right. yeah. for for <laughs> several years, and and that was kind of at the point where I was I was sort of coming up as an assistant pro, and and when you were kind of you know, in those events. And what was the, sort of the highlight of your six wins, Simon? What, what was the, the memory for you? Oh, I think out of my six wins, I think it's got to be the Dunhill. Yeah. I really mm. do. Just, I mean, I remember my caddy was in tears coming down the last because it's mm-hmm. such a special place. I was I mean, three shots clear, so I knew we knew I'd won it. And it was just, you know, I, I said to him, like, can you believe we're going to win at St. Andrews? Yeah. And he couldn't mm-hmm. speak. He couldn't speak. I mean, the first, that first front eight holes is some of the best golf I've ever played. Uh, I was seven under through eight. Jeez, and I remember wow. walking down the eight and McElroy's coming uh, on, the eight, on the seventh and he just kind of looked over. I looked over at him and he, you could see him mouth, calm the down <laughs> I won't say what he actually said but um, yeah it was just one of those the hole felt massive uh, I was playing nicely but I just hold everything and then just played solid on the back nine but the Irish the last nine holes of the Irish coming down the stretch is the best golf I've ever played really yeah that's, that's the most memorable stretch where you felt like you had yeah. your most control of a golf ball. Definitely. But as, as in terms of my favourite win, I'd say Dunhill, just purely because of where it was. Mm-hmm. I, I, can't even, I can't even imagine, you know, t- to put yourself in a position oh. to win. To and win to an enjoy event. the walk also, oh, like it, up 18. It, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's got to be the best 18th hole to yeah. know you're going to win and just stride up there and go, okay, let me finish this off and grab the trophy. Yeah, I think that's why I could actually enjoy it. Yeah, because I was three clear. Mm-hmm. Um, sixteen and seventeen, I didn't enjoy. I've got to be honest. Yeah, yeah, you've got to uh, hit some I mean, proper tee shots on sixteen and seventeen, yeah, don't sure, you? Right? Yeah, I mean, it's I, I hold a really good putt on sixteen, and then I got on seventeen and just thought, hit it down the second. Yeah, <laughs> <I'm> not, <laughs> keep double bogey off your card. Yeah, yeah. It's so true. And I managed to make. I'm, I made a bogey, but it was one of the best bogeys I think I've ever made. <laughs> I think that that Dunhill, even as an amateur, is one that we'd all want to play in the pro am. I don't know how you get yeah. into it. It's it's. I've heard it's. I heard it's hard to do. But maybe before uh, I leave planet Earth, that would be uh, that'd be a bucket list for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you'd enjoy that. You really would. I mean, you get some. You get some good celebrities playing in it. Some <laughs> top pros playing in it as well. It's just a really fun event as well. You know, everybody seems to, you know, embrace it for what it is. Is it fair to say, just for those that aren't super familiar with the European Tour, Pebble Beach Pro Am and Dunhill yeah, are yeah. sort of the equivalent? Exactly the, the same. Yeah, same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just think uh, the space of Pebble and, and St Andrews are, are obviously they're so iconic. They're so them. iconic. It's it's holy ground uh, for, for for us golfers. Well, how it? many tour players would name either St Andrews or Pebble Beach as their last yeah. round of golf before yeah. they die? Right, like so many players have said one or the other. I think probably. The four of us, a couple of us would say the same thing, right? Yeah, I mean, people who haven't played it, you'd, you'd think they'd put it on the bucket list, wouldn't you? Avid really? golfers, it'd be up in the top three or five, definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the injury comes around and, and sort of how, how is the injury recovering with the, this tendon issue and the wrist and stuff? like? How's it doing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's okay. It'll never, it'll never, you know, go again it'll never happen what happened will never happen again I've had it fixed but it's kind of I lost my flexibility I've lost the power in it I mean I'm forever doing wrist exercises with 
you know, balls, bands, things like that. Um, and it'll never have the, the range, the flexibility that it had. Um, and it showed when I came back, I mean, the year before I did it, I finished about 28th in the order of merit. Um, and then the following year, when I actually came back, I made two cuts. So my game just, it totally went. It totally went. It was a shame, really, because I was playing some nice golf. Um, yeah, but I just... And while I, was, while I was off, I kind of started looking at life after golf, really. And, and when I wasn't playing that good, that very well, I kind of... The, the thought of not playing and starting something new was more appealing, to be honest. Because I wasn't yeah. enjoying it. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was away from my family. Um, you know, it was costing a lot of money to do what I was doing. You know, I'd miss a cut on a Friday and I'd think, oh, nice one, I can go home. Yeah. You know, wow. as soon as you start feeling like that, it's time to reevaluate what you're doing. So we had a big spell of about four, five, six months off. Um, I went and did my, my uh, TPI in LA. I went and did my NASM, National Academy in Sport and Medicine, level two, three, four, golf fitness. Uh, and I just started looking at what I could do after golf. And that's where I am now, really. Love that. That's great. Yeah, I think that the, the injury, you could call it like a blessing in disguise because with this elite golf performance, what you've started is is pretty impressive. And and I like the the note you have on it is, you know, you could, you could help any player or any golfer get better, which is, which is impressive. Can you dive into elite golf performance? Thanks, mate. Yeah, I've actually, I, I called it elite golf performance to start with. And then I thought I was really advertising to a small minority. So I've just called it the Simon Dyson Performance Academy now. So basically, mm-hmm. um, it's getting people in. I get them in the gym first, give them the full screening, warm them up properly. So we spend a good hour, hour and 20 in the gym. And then we go out onto the range. I watch them hit it. I get them to find out more about their own game than they actually know. Like people will come up to me, scratch plus one handicappers. And I'll be like, right, how far do you hit your eight iron? And they'll be like, "Um, I think I hit it about 140, between 145 and 150. I'm like, you need to know exactly how far you hit that eight iron. So we go through all the scoring clubs and then get them on the rate, get them on the short game for a bit, show them, you know, improve the short game and then have a bit of lunch, bit of putting, and then I go and take them out on the course and I, and I watch them play because for me, that is where you really get to watch a player, what they're good at and what they're poor at. The range can be quite deceiving. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so it's a pretty cool experience, that whole, like, you know, going through the bag, which is, which is neat. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the on-course stuff. I mean, the three things that I love are the fitness, mm-hmm. the short game. I love short game. Watching them, watching somebody improve a certain shot within five or six balls. That's the, that's the beauty of short game, I think. And how important is it? Um, and then the on-course stuff. The on-course stuff's great. Just getting them to, I try and simplify it for them because they'll be like, right, I want to do this with it. And I'm like, well, why don't you try doing this? And they go, oh yeah, I've never really looked at it like that. So all of a sudden, you know, you get someone off two and they'll shoot two under for nine holes. And they're like, that felt the easiest nine holes ever. I'm just, it's all about getting, plotting your way around a little bit more instead of, instead of literally just autopilot grabbing for the driver head cover. Would you say there's a common fault with amateurs, whether they're a, you know, two handicap or a 10 handicap when it comes to short game? Short game. Yeah. I don't think the talk properly, if I'm honest, I don't think the talk fundamentals properly. I don't think the talk landing zone, spin, lies, everything's off perfect lies to the same flag. Whereas I've learned with how you learn, it's all about variability. So you change your shots up every single time and get them to, you know, I always say to my players, let's go and practice out of that thick, long rough. And they're like, why? I went, because the minute you master that, how easy does it feel off the fairway? 
you know so that's kind of and then we go out on the course and i put them in all sorts of dodgy lies and before you know it you start seeing them go oh that's how that one reacts and then they play it and get up and down i'm like great you start up and down in it from lies like that it's a, it's a pretty easy game it's a brilliant approach that simon and it's it's kind of unique in the sense that how many players are still going for the the lesson with the pro where they're going to have them hit off a perfect lie yep. and, and then go, okay, go and apply that. And then they come back and they're no better. Well, they're not actually getting up and down like Simon said, because they've, it, sure, maybe your basic technique, your, your, it's, just, it's the same thing you said about the driving range. I mean, the driving range is deceiving because you're hitting off a perfect lie yeah. over and over again with your line yeah. stick to the same flag. Yeah. If you do that on the short game, yeah, you have no versatility. Yeah. And then you won't actually get up and down probably unless you have that perfect lie on the mm-hmm. golf course, which you really never do. And it's the same with the putting, you know, you, how many times do you go on a putting green and you watch a guy get a sleeve of balls out, <laughs> three goes at the first hole and he holds the last one. He has three goes at the second one, holds the last one, mm-hmm. three goes at the third, holds maybe the second and last one. And he's like, well, oh, I'm putting all right. Yeah, but yeah. yet that first one, he missed every <laughs> single time and you only get one go. So true. So like I've been chatting to Kenya and I've been chatting to Jamie Donaldson from Aimpoint. I'm chatting with Preston Combs next Wednesday and they all say it's all about that one ball. Yeah. You know, it's all about that one ball. And I remember years ago, Pete Cowan saying to me, go and watch this lad. He's called Christian Savar. He was a French lad. Go and watch him put. And I went and watched him for half an hour and I came back and he went, what's the one thing that you took from that? I went, it's every put like it matters. And he went, exactly. <laughs> He, yeah. he puts with one ball and, and he lines everything up. He's looking around. Every putt is like it's to win a tournament. And he went, mm. that's why he's one of the best putters on the tour. And I remember Christian Sever, he was, he, was, he was someone who wasn't a particularly long hitter or, or he, you know, he wasn't, sort of a, he wasn't a, one of the stronger long game guys right. out there. So obviously he's applying you know, his, his strength to... to uh, and he, he, did he win, he won the French... Uh, or something. I don't know whether he won the French. I know he won the um, he won the the one at the London Club. Was right. it the English? Is that what it was? I remember. I remember English he got a, a good win somewhere, and it was kind of a, a bit of an underdog story. But yeah, that's that's interesting. So, yeah. do you think fundamentally there's a, a, an issue with you know elite performers and people who underperform in just application? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think I watch. When I was on Challenge Tour, and I'm thinking to myself, right, we're going to be pretty close to maybe me going down this new route. Let's mm-hmm. kind of keep an eye on a few lads on the Challenge Tour. And they all they all hit it perfect. You know, you're watching them on the range and you're looking at them going, you all hit it great. Yeah. You know, what's... And that's where it got me thinking, well, how could, how could I help them? And that's where it, it comes down to... <laughs> How are you applying your practice time? Um, you know, I spoke with Stuart Morgan last night. Um, yeah. Stuart Morgan teaches Bert Weisberger. And I right. said, like, what, what are your practice sessions like? And he said, every single shot matters mm-hmm. on the range. And all these lads see is that big, wide open field and they open the shoulders and they hit it pure. Yeah. And then they get on the first hole, there's a bunker down the left, out of bounds down the right, and they don't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's a great takeaway. Yeah. I think it, it, it resonates with me because the, the, the amount of hours I've wasted on a range, I can tell you, is, is pretty upsetting when I think about it. You but and me both. Thing. Yeah, I think, I mean, everyone's done <laughs> yeah. it. Right? It's just like Everybody. the lack of purpose. It, would you say it's, um, I think probably getting the idea in, your, in their head is probably the easiest part. Would you say it's more an issue of discipline after that, Simon? Like to get yeah. someone to not just beat balls and waste putts and waste chip shots. It's all discipline. Well, we're, we're creatures of habit, aren't we? Yes. So if you're used to bashing balls, I could tell you that I'm blue in the face that the only way to learn is by doing it this way. And you might do it for three or four days. And then you go, oh, I feel like I need to work on my swing. I'm going to go back this way. And yeah. that's what happens. So, you know, until, until I could maybe go out on tour and actually be with them week in, week out, then it's it's going to be tough to change their mindset, I think. But some people get it. Some get it straight away. And, the, you know, they're like, 
will this actually work? I'm like, it'll take time. Mm-hmm. But if you trust it, then you'll get it. You'll, you'll see the benefits from it. I think one of the things that will possibly you will find easier with your messaging is you've been there and you've done it. Very true. So I think, you know, when they hear it from you, they're like, well, you know, it's Simon's achieved incredible success. Yeah. Yep. You know, that, that must be the recipe towards, right, I'll, I'll go down that route. Whereas if it's somebody who's talking about theory, mm-hmm. that's, that's maybe a little bit different. Yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. I always say, I always tell them the two sides to, to me, basically. When I came back from my injury, I got so technical, yeah. so technical. I wanted the club to be in that position mm-hmm. and I could never get it in that position and my game went downhill and I lost the ability to score. Um, Whereas, take me back to the beginning of my career, Hong Kong Open, I always tell this story, I was on the range with one of my pals, an American guy called Clay Devers, hitting all all types of shots. We were on the range for two hours, and we were challenging each other to hit different shots. So every shot, again, had a purpose, but every shot was done with a different club. And we're challenging each other. And I won the tournament because I then went into the tournament thinking there isn't one shot on this course that I haven't just hit. Yeah. And I won the tournament. And and I always tell people that story. And I'm like, if you can get your head around that, mm-hmm. you know, who knows what you can achieve. Because, I again, Pete Cowan used to hit more balls than anybody when he was a pro. Yeah. And I said to him, what benefit did you get from that? He went, <clears throat> he said, Honestly, it made my muscles stronger. And that was it. <laughs> That's a great answer. Yeah. yeah. How much of an influence was, was uh, you know, Pete on, on what you sort of deliver now? How much of, of what you teach and, and apply has, has to do with, with Pete? Because when I hear you talk about the short game, I, I think about him a lot. I do. I do. He taught me so much more about the short game than I ever, th- ever thought he could do. Yeah. Um, just certain lies, right? You want to do this for that lie, right? Another lie, you want to do this. And just the ability to deliver it differently as well. So if somebody mm-hmm. don't get it, he knows another way to deliver it. Um, the, the practice side of it, you know, I mean, he was my mentor. He was like a yeah. father figure to me, was Pete. Um, the practice side of it, is a little bit different because the more I've spoken to you guys know Ian Highfield at at Mm -hmm. game like training he's now at Ledbetter down in Florida I speak with Ian loads he sends me papers tells me to read books listen to podcasts all about how we learn yeah and it's all to do with you know your variability your challenge and your spacing and how long you space your each ball even between each other is how you come back and then you retain that information. Stuart says exactly the same. Whereas Pete never really taught me that. I've learned that more since I've stopped playing, really. Yeah. But I think that's just the the tendency on toys. Everybody teaches technical. They do. Yeah. Do, uh, do, you, but, think, do you think that'll be a, a sort of, in terms of generational coaching tendencies? Because I think of probably when you first went out there, how many people did Bob Torrance coach? when you were first out there. I mean, Bob had had a lot of them. Pete had a lot of them. And, you know, there was all these, all these guys. And, but how many of them were teaching that type of coaching? That was, they were teaching swing, but yeah. not many of them were teaching the game and, and how to apply that to practice. Not at all. And I think without him actually telling me that he was delivering it to me that way, Pete mm-hmm. did do that with me because he always yeah. got me hitting the nine shots. Right. High fade, high straight, high draw, all the nine shots. And we mm-hmm. used to do that a lot. And he'd say, like, right, pick your target, change your target. So there was a lot of that that he was doing. But then, I mean, a lot of it, I'd, I'd be working just bashing ball, trying to work on my swing and, yeah. you know, um, fool me, really. So obviously now, <laughs> I, now I look at, you know, how you learn. Mm-hmm. You can't groove your swing. It's impossible. Muscle memory doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. It's all cognitive. So the more you challenge what you're thinking about, that's how you learn and retain that information. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's I think there's smart. so many good takeaways uh, from that. Take me back again. We'll just want to dive back in a little bit. Yeah. When you became a Nike athlete, 
what was, what was that like? Because that was a unique thing to, to, to sign with a brand like Nike, not, not one of the, the kind of big sort of manufacturers, not a Callaway or a Titleist. And, you know, Nike, being a Nike athlete was different. It was one of the best days of my life, I've got to be honest. When my, I was with Chubby Chandler, mm -hmm. he was my manager. He came up to me, said, um, I've got some uh, information for you. I said, what's that? He said, um, Nike are really interested in you. I said, right. I said, what's all the stuff like? I went, I know the clothes will be amazing, but I was like, yeah. what, what's the equipment like? He said, it's really good. So I was like, well, Tiger's with him. I just want to see, I just want to check the ball and I want to check the driver. So went and checked the ball. Nike Toe Star D. I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. Fantastic ball. Loved it. And then they just brought out the square driver, the SQ. That's right. That's right. I remember you I, used that. was the first one you had. With and him. I remember I was at the Dunhill Links and Mark Warren was there and he was already yep. Nike. Yeah, Mark, Mark Warren. Warren's there on the range. I went up to him. I said, can I just have a look at this driver? He went, yeah, of course you can. So I put it down. I was like, it's different, but it sits so pure. It sat so like, I mean, they call it square, which, yeah. but it did sit. The face was so square on it. Mm -hmm. So I said, do you mind if I just have a couple of shots? He went, yeah, of course you can. So I hit this one shot and it just went, you know, when you see Trapman, it goes up and then the down one comes straight <laughs> back down the same one. Yeah. It literally flew like that. I just went, that's all right. And I phoned Chubby. I went, yeah, let's sign. <laughs> it was literally, I was buzzing. <clears throat> and I used to do this thing when I teed my ball up, almost to pin, keep myself, pinching myself that I was with Nike. I almost, I used to tee my ball up and face the swoosh. So I was looking at the swoosh to remind yeah. myself that, I was with one of the best companies in the world. It's the best. That's a great story. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's the thing. If, if you're selected, I just think that's such a, a, a special, iconic thing to be selected mm. to be a Nike athlete. Yeah. Because you're not a golfer at that point. You're, you're, you're a global athlete if you sign with Nike. You're thinking about Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Yeah. All these yeah, all those guys. enormous kind of names in, in sports. Mm -hmm. And I think all golfers pretty much have another sport that they love as much as golf. Yeah. Whether it's basketball, football, uh, American or yeah. European football. Yeah. There's yeah. so many people that you identify with as heroes and then you feel like, oh, I'm on that team also. Mm -hmm. That's, that's kind there of, is. I can understand why it was so important to you. There is. And they just make you feel so special. I remember going to the oven in mm -hmm. Texas down there, in Dallas, mm -hmm. and um, just make you feel so welcome. And it was, yeah, like you say, you're a, you're a Nike athlete. I think there was only, at the time when I signed, I think there was only four or five of us in Europe. Yeah. So it's not like mm. it is today. I mean, literally nearly every man in his dog has the Nike stuff on now, don't they? Yeah. Because yeah. they're not yeah. doing the equipment, so they can push right. the clothing a bit more. But there was only about four or five of us. And like you're saying about feeling special, mm -hmm. I remember playing uh, Beth Page Black. Uh, US Open and we were just walking down I can't even remember what street it was in New York and the Nike stores there in New York mm -hmm. and it had all of us it had a big poster of all of us who were playing so in the cool. in the um, US Open I was there in a in a shop window in New York in a Nike store and it was like double take amazing yeah. amazing feeling yeah was that the Lucas Glover US Open it was, it was oh, Lucas, yeah. yeah. That yeah. was it. One, of your, it one of your staff members, yeah. It rained from Monday to Monday, basically. <laughs> yeah, my course must have been so long. Oh, it was longest. so long. It was so long. The rough was about a foot deep. <laughs> I playing a practice round, and they were they were raking the rough backwards. Oh, oh God! I know. It's I know. Nasty. It was that was brutal. Some nasty behavior. I, that's really cool just to hear it really quickly that the, the square driver, I think a lot of people assume like the Nike players played it because they had to. Yeah. They all hated it. They probably just did it for the money. It's really cool to hear you say like, I took one swing with it. I went, oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. And like you enjoyed Aww. playing it. It wasn't like it was a crap idea. It was just, I mean, did it sound a bit funny? Fine. Mm -hmm. But someone of your caliber going, a couple swings and going, yeah, I'd like to go play tour golf with that. It's such a cool kind of takeaway. Yeah. What was such a, such a landmark in, I guess, club design. Obviously. I don't think anyone's making a square driver again, but the idea of MOI and moving 
uh, the weight so far out there and kind of making something so stable and that you just picked it up and went, yeah, that's great. Let me go play. Yeah. You know, I mean, I always say half of enjoy, half of being able to hit something is looking down and thinking, well, that looks nice. Mm. And I, and I did. And Mm -hmm. it was, it was like the second version of the one that they'd done. You remember the one KJ Choi used to use? Yeah. Like a, like a, um, a pan, wasn't it? Yeah. Whereas the one I used was a lot more deader sound. Um, Mm -hmm. but I mean, it, I just, you never used to miss fairways with it. So I just thought back then it wasn't really about the length. It was when you're playing courses with thick rough, it is more about hitting the fairways. Mm -hmm. Whereas now the length side of it's, you know, taken off, but it was all about hitting fairways and man, did I hit a lot of fairways with that club. Yeah, maybe maybe let's touch on, on that if you can, Simon. How has the game evolved in, in this sort of time from uh, when you first came on tour and, and then you had uh, you know all your success in, in a great window and then obviously for what the game is now, where it mm. does seem, even though the, the averages when we look at them on paper aren't crazy different from what they were before, but it is a different game, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you said it before when you said about being a Nike athlete. I mean, everybody's an athlete now. Yeah. And if you're not doing something fitness related, you you are falling behind. You really are. And it shows all these stats that show, you know, greens in reg, greens in regulation now, fairways hit compared to distance off the tee. Yeah. And it's 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 showing distance off the tee is proving more beneficial than fairways hit and greens hit. So yeah. well, maybe not greens hit, but definitely fairways hit Mm -hmm. because these lads are so strong they're getting the thick rough you know they're carrying it 330 so they're way ahead and you know it's it's, they're just making the game a lot easier but technology's had a big part in that but I think everybody's got a lot stronger and fitter as well I really do yeah Simon, do you, uh, did you tinker much on tour? I know you're saying, you know, that the Nike driver, you hit it once or a couple of times and you were set with it, but did you tinker quite a bit on tour or were you kind of one of those guys that once you had your equipment, you were, you know, set for the season? Yeah, I was one of them. Literally, I, a driver would last me the, the season, three would last me the season, my irons would, uh, unless they came out with something that you were like, I need those. Um, wedges, you know, couple couple a year um but that's about it really i and I, I knew what worked so i thought what's the point in trying to find maybe four extra yards off the tee when i know four extra yards doesn't really make that much difference yeah and do you have an equipment assessment now with with a lot of the players you work with yeah um there's a place over here it's called torex there's a guy called Nick Hibbs, used to work for um, Adams on Adams, tour. Yeah. So he's set up there. So one of the first things I always say is, let's have a look at your equipment. <clears throat> and especially to the, the pros, I work with a few um, LAT pros, ladies, and you know they've had the same equipment for like three years, four years, mm. five years. And I'm like, it's moved on so much since then. Yeah. Um, so first thing I do is call Nick up, right? We're going to do a full, full evaluation of of the clubs, basically, and you, they see the gains straight away, and it's it's frightening. Yeah, <laughs> Hebsey's a good friend of ours, Simon. Good lad, Nick. Really he is good a good lad. lad, and it's great to have that to have a team built around you, isn't it? Where you you know you can send your players and have confidence that they're going to be well looked after. And it's not obviously not just the fitting; it's also the building. That's something that Nick is 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 world class at when it comes to the the building and making sure ensuring those specs are really dialed in for the player. Absolutely, he's he's very good at it, and he's you know he's made a good living at it. Um, I think. Yeah, it's just giving them the exp- you know, that experience of what all the boys get on tour every week. And I think yeah. that might almost be a bit of a downfall to a lot of players as well. Mm-hmm. I remember Chubby saying about Darren Clark when he went kit free. He, he could choose whatever he wanted. And he yeah. was trying something new every week. Instead right. of sticking with something that worked... Mm. You know, he was trying something new every week. Whereas, I mean, I've got to be honest. If I went playing again, I'm with I'm with Cobra. Um, but if I if I was 
ever going to go back to playing properly, mm -hmm. I would really go and get a full, full evaluation of, of where the Cobra gear is for me compared mm -hmm. to maybe what I hit the best. Who knows? <laughs> it might be that that I hit the best. But um, yeah, I'd go and get the full evaluation because yeah. it can, it, it's, worth, it's worth every penny. Mm -hmm. It's for sure. Um, there's a pretty cool picture behind you there uh, mm -hmm. on, on the couch the with uh, the, the boss. He is the boss. So you played on on Seve Trophy um, teams. Yeah. How was that experience to be in the team environment? It's very different. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely loved it. I, I thought I, you would love it. Oh, yeah. I I really did. I was, you know, that is, I love being around people and, you know, we never get to experience it. So the one, I mean, I'm, I didn't play Ryder Cup, so I played mm -hmm. the three Seve trophies. So yeah, the one yeah. chance of that year that I got to um, experience it, I always said, like, I'm going to enjoy this as much as I can. And it showed, you know, we, we won every one. Mm -hmm. We won every one that I played in. Um, and I think we just had a really good team atmosphere like you're doing the Ryder Cup yeah and, and, and where does where does that because there was a period obviously when your world ranking was was you're inside the top 30 making Seve trophy teams winning pretty pretty regular mm -hmm. how much was the Ryder Cup in your mind because in, in our little intro I, I had said to the boys that I thought you would have been a perfect Ryder Cup player I mean a polter type of energy yes. to come to yeah. the to the team environment it was massively up there as something I wanted to do. Really yeah. was. Um, I had to finish. I had to finish. I had to win Glen Eagles. Um, oh, which was Celtic Manor, two thousand ten. Ten, yeah. I had to win Glen Eagles to make the team, and I finished yeah. third. Oh. And even by finishing third, I thought I could get a pick. Sure. I could get a pick here. But the other lad who was up against me in the pick was Eduardo Molinari, and he won it. Oh, okay. Oh, really? And he won it. Yeah, yeah. So, and obviously Francesco had made that. I, I, I remember exactly. going to Celtic Manor, and the big thing was they wanted to pair Francesco yeah. and Eduardo okay, okay. as the team. Right, right. Um, so he phoned me up, and he literally said, you know, I'd love to have you in my team, but, you know, he's just won. His brother's with Eduardo. There'll be an easy pairing. Yeah. Um, basically, try again next year. Yeah, that's a, tough, <laughs> that's a tough thing to hear, I'm sure. But yeah, so it was. Close and, it was because yeah. that was that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to play Ryder Cup so bad because I don't care how nervous I'd have been. You know, I'd have on the flip side, I'd have been you know so excited to have to just have had an opportunity to play it mm. because yeah. that. Again, like Walker Cup is amateur, you know, majors and Ryder Cup for Europeans mm -hmm. are definitely high up there, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. sounds like that. I think, um, would you say it's safe <clears throat> to say as a young European golfer, like playing on the Ryder Cup is sort of the dream where American kind of golfers, they think winning the Masters is the dream. <laughs> is that kind of a fair assessment? Is it that big for uh, European Yeah, I play? think it is in Europe. I do. I th and I think you might be right, like in America, the... They had a. I feel like they had a spell where they weren't bothered about it, with that new group coming through and things like that. Mm. I feel like that's, mm. and Europe took it a lot more serious. They prepared better for them, mm -hmm. um, but now I think, you know, you saw a different team when Tiger with the Presidents Cup. You saw a different team there all of a sudden, didn't you? Yeah, uh, I, I think so too. Yeah, all kind of playing to for each other instead of for themselves. And I think this year could be a different, maybe not a different story, but it'll be a, it'll be a really good challenge. Yeah. Different, different atmosphere. Ahead, I, yeah. Yeah. If very it goes true. ahead, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully it does. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. Um, if we talk a little bit about sort of the majors you played, mm. you know, played a couple of masters. What was it like getting over to Augusta? Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, Pete had always said, asked me if I wanted to go with him to experience it, and mm. I always said no. First time I ever go, I want to play. Want to so, it. and then I managed to, yeah, 2010 was my first one. 
Yeah. I remember winning again, won the Dunhill, and that secured me top 50. Right. So from like from that day till the Masters, I knew I was playing it really. That's so amazing. unbelievable. I think about I think about 16 of us went over. Friends, family, mm. brother, what a girlfriend at the time, now my wife, my yeah, mum and dad, their friends, my brother's friends, my friend. Just a great experience driving mm. down Magnolia Lane for the first time. I mean, I kind of compare it to when I, when you're coming into St Andrews and you turn around yeah. that turn around the corner and you see the old clubhouse for the you first see the time. Clubhouse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's I, and I saw that years and years ago. So I just remember it being a really special moment when I saw it, mm. and and I compare it to that driving down Magnolia Lane, seeing the clubhouse, the the flag and the the island, and then you you know, you drive around to the car park, just something very special, something I'll remember for the rest of my life, that is for sure. Mm. The, the whole week is, is so special, isn't it, from the practice rounds and, and obviously the, uh, the yeah. part three competition and um, just, just the whole thing must just be an incredible experience. Well, I played, I went and played it before I played the Houston Open. Right. So I got an invite to the Houston Open because they always set it up a bit like uh, Augusta. Yeah, same fashions. same green, same mm-hmm. sand, same type of rough. And went and played it and I was just there on my own. I was literally the only person on the course, me and my caddy. Mm. So it was quite surreal there, uh, just playing it, no one around. Really yeah. enjoyed it. I think I took about five hours to get round, you know, just <laughs> hitting 12 balls off what off the 12 <laughs> tee and things like that. That's right. <laughs> um, and then we went and played the tournament. Uh, I made the cup. We flew in Sunday night. And then I got up to the course on Monday at about, I think, 11 o'clock, something like that. And there was 25,000 people there. Jeez. And I'm just like, oh, my God. <laughs> this place is unbelievable. And all of a sudden, you saw Augusta for what it truly yeah. is. It was yeah. really mega, mega experience. And obviously the Open Championship 2011, Clarkie's win. Um, you know, yeah. you, you'd a great finish that <clears> week, and you'd a great first round. Where, I think you were a couple under first round, 68. And yeah, uh, that's right. I played you, with you uh, Woodland right and Beyond. Woodland right. and Beyond first two rounds because I, I think I shot 68, two under. Yeah, and I think Beyond shot 66, mm. and I played unbelievable for two under, and he shot 66, which was <laughs> a hell of a round. Yeah, and it was the first time I'd played with Gary, um, and again I'd heard he was long off the tee, and I remember yeah. hitting this driver off the first. Thought, oh, I bet that all right, that. And then he hits this three wood and kind of <laughs> spins it up a bit, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, everyone said he was long. Anyway, we get down there, get to the first ball, and it's me, and he's like twenty past me. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, he's long, and then he drove. Thinks about the fifth. 378 yard par four he drove it Jeez. yeah he's, he's got some different gears hasn't he he, he, he really, can really he can step on it we we done a little bit together I'd done some fitting with him at the Canadian Open in 2016 and he he, he just came back from playing at, I think it was Burkdale was 16 and you know come, he, I'd got a call because he was struggling with his driver just after the Open Championship he was you know, typical playing the Open he's leaning on it a little bit spinning it up and yeah. He, he kind of wasn't wasn't happy with how he was hitting it, and he was still hitting it plenty long enough. But by the time he'd kind of got, got kind of back in his groove, all the players at the Canadian Open, Mike was there with me. They'd kind of congregated to watch him because he was he was flying it into this hospitality tent at the back of the range, and and that was about three hundred and fifty yards away. And uh, he just he has a, a gear that not many other players have. Yeah, he does. He um, he's he's massively upped his game, massively improved his game. I was yeah. impressed with him when I played with him, to be honest. But mm-hmm. then, obviously, Pete Cowan started working with him yeah. and started maybe giving him a few extra a few extra shots mm-hmm. that he'd maybe struggled with, which gave him a couple of extra gears. And you know, you you see him at that stinger now. Yeah, uh, he can hit it wow. ten foot off the floor. He can hit it one hundred and fifty mm-hmm. feet off the floor. So yeah. He's got a he's got a lot more to his game now, and he's do you know what? He's a top lad as well. I, I really enjoyed my time. I, I enjoyed company, been in yeah. his company. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. We talk about him and his length, but the shot that sticks out in our minds now is that that um, second shot on 17 at the, yeah, that's the right. Pebble Beach that where he hit green. that lob wedge off the green um, and, and yeah. just the touch he showed for someone who, who's obviously renowned for his length. That just shows the shots that you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you need them. You know, he's, he's a major winner now. Yeah. I, I, yep. You don't win majors by not being able to be creative and hit shots like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, this has been incredible just to, to really, sort of take really a little trip down memory lane and hear yeah. a little bit more about it. Where, where do you sort of reassess your goals now? What's, what's, what do you want to achieve in golf now that you're kind of in the, the role you're in now? Oh, there's a couple of things, really. I'd like to, um, I mean, I obviously want to be as better, as good a coach as I can possibly be. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really loving the learning process. Yeah. And, you know, everybody keeps saying to me, if you want to be a good coach, you'll learn every single day. You know, there'll mm-hmm. be, you know, the more you learn, the less you, fi- the less you find out you know. Yeah. You know, which is so true. You know, I know, I know a lot more now about coaching but there's things I thought I knew that don't apply anymore so now I know less but uh, I'm just enjoying it as well I'm enjoying getting getting lads in I'm coming at it from a very different point of view yeah you know um coaching with been successful as well or you know pretty successful <clears throat> as a player um but yeah I mean I'm really enjoying it I'd love to be a top coach one day I really would. I love the mindset. I love looking at, you know, the psychological side of golf and how that can be improved by easy little things. Um, but I'd like to play again, you know, seniors. I'd like to, I'd like to get the clubs back out at some point. I'm still pretty fit. I'm 42. Yeah. Um, you know, if the if they lower the age to forty five, I've only got three years. <laughs> no, I, <haven't>. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you, you do keep you know, fitness is a huge thing to you, and you keep incredibly fit. So that that is a, as a goal is is something that's very achievable. It'd be great to see out there. Yeah, would you play in the in the UK? Is there a there's a European? The, but yeah, it's, stay show, stay shows in Europe, isn't it? Yeah, but no, okay. yeah. I'd want to be out there. I'd want to be the yeah. other side of the Atlantic. Definitely, right. yeah. testing against be... the proper uh, against the big boys. Yeah, well, you look at someone like uh, like Paul Broadhurst in, in the career he's made for himself since. I mean, nuts! Uh, you know, Paul used to uh, come up. He was working with Gary Nickel um, as his yeah. coach at the time, and he would come up. And I was working at the TaylorMade Centre there, and Gary would coach, and you know, I'd do a little bit of work with Paul. And never someone that you would you would say is is a uh, you know uh, a supreme sort of ball striker from a length perspective but he could he could hit the shots he needed to hit but the the success he's had has been incredible over there yeah unbelievable i've known brody a long time <laughs> and he always had that little little hook little hooky <laughs> shot you know a little little uh, fidgety over the ball yeah. on me yeah, um, absolutely but unbelievable competitor made yeah. shed loads of birdies mm-hmm. i always remember that about him just used to make loads of birdies. Um, but yeah, I mean, the success he's had, you look at him and he's done fantastic and fair play to him. He's a, he's a top bloke, he's Brody. Yeah. yeah. Well, Simon, thank you so much yeah, for your time. You so this, is, this has been great. brilliant. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And, and thanks for all the, the content you're putting out there. It's really good. Oh, I can speak for all three of us. We're all really enjoying yes. uh, the content the that you're putting out there. Yeah, oh, just yeah. all of it. <laughs> you know, just, just, just everything that you're busy. doing. Yeah, it's brilliant. It, it really is. And I think it's a great outlet. And, and you know, you're doing everything right. It's, it's such so nice to see such a fresh approach uh, to, to coaching. Thanks. Yeah, I enjoy the stuff you guys do as well. I, I watch your page all the time and, awesome. you know, keep it going. You're doing really well. We certainly enjoy it. That. All right, my friend. We'll take care and we'll, we'll definitely stay in touch. Lovely. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thanks, Cheers. Simon. Cheers. Okay, boys. So, I mean, that was that was more of a treat than I think any of us would have even ever expected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, a lot of super down to earth. Yeah, he's really good to talk to. But interesting career, like someone who's yeah. played at the highest level, achieved you know just about as as much as you could hope for, and then moved into sort of the player performance coaching side. Uh, he's really going to have two careers in that in that sense. Great to see the energy he's bringing to it. I just think that's the standout thing for me when you hear him talk about it. He's, yeah. he's really infused oh, yeah, by, he's by the it. coaching side of things. Yeah.
Yeah, no, very, very, very cool. Um, you know, just the stories for, for someone who's done as much as he's done mm. um, and, and kind of things he's seen. Uh, obviously, we, we stuck to a lot to his career stories and, th- and things like that. But um, I think there's going to be a wave of, of those types of guys. You know, Robert Rock is, is another a, one who's in a similar mold. He's one on tour. Yep. Went into the coaching side of things. These guys have so much to, to give and so much to offer. And I think that's, we were talking very briefly about sort of him convincing players to practice a certain way. And you made a good point. I think because he's, you know, he's a six-time winner, yeah. he's a Walker Cup player, people will go for a lesson with him and yeah. go, okay, I really, I can believe you as a coach and yeah. I know that you did it as a player. Yeah. I know you failed a certain way. And I know you succeeded with this method and it makes it mm-hmm. way more credible. It really does. Question for both of you. Right. Did either of you think, I really want to go and do that day with Simon Dyson? 100%. 100%. I would do that I'd go heartbeat. right now. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the one thing I, I wrote a note, like every time we talk, I like jot down notes and yeah, I mean, we try, we offer like the tour experience when it comes to club fitting, but I mean, that is, that is one of the, probably the best experiences you could get, whether it's with him or another top coach, but for him to go through the whole bag and mm-hmm. assess everything rather than you. I mean, we said it during the podcast was, you know, the pro stands behind you. You beat a bunch of six irons. You go, see you later. You come for your fitting. You can't hit a driver to save your life because the co- the the teacher doesn't know how to fix or the, you know, the pro shop assistant doesn't know how to fix yeah. your driver. Um, yeah. So for him to go through the whole bag, the fitness thing is, I think is number one. Um, but yeah, sign me up. I would, I would do that in a heartbeat. A I, I knew both of you oh, I and know. I was the same. I was like, well, next time I'm in the UK, I can oh. definitely see myself going down and having that like day with Stay him. at a resort nearby, and that's like that's your life yeah, for a couple so of days. Yeah, so Simon's at uh, Mottram Hall, which is right. just outside Manchester, which is a really top venue. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I can't wait to, to, to say to everyone that that is the future of coaching. Mm. If you want to invest money in, in, in sort of you and your game, and, and I'm going to con- contradict something, don't buy the next big driver. Do this. Don't first. buy the next big iron set. Yeah. Go and invest whatever that costs because it's probably a similar amount of money. Oh, for sure it would be. And and yeah. go and have a day with Simon. Learn the life of a of a high performance athlete. Yes, and perf- and uh, go through the routine that they would. Absolutely. That's the proper routine. I think, right that's, I think that's brilliant. Yeah, I love that. I think a lot of people will listen to that and go sign me yeah. up for that. And if they can do it locally, hopefully there's places in the states and Canada that do something similar. But yeah, if you're in the UK, I would say go there. <laughs> Go there for sure. No, top, 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 man. And um, someone I think that, you know, we will try to stay in good contact with. And, uh, and I'm really, really keen to, you know, follow his, his kind of, you know, coach or life as a coach and Definitely. career as a coach. I think it's going to be brilliant. Hopefully we can visit one day when we get over there. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, guys, um, that was episode five um, of the, the season two of the podcast. I really appreciate all your all your sort of support and, and everyone listening. We've had some great guests yes. uh, so far this season. We have another one, uh, our next guest, Mr. Peter Finch, coming up it's soon is great. one that we're really excited about uh, chatting with. We obviously had our podcast with Rick Shields. We loved that. I loved it, yeah. And we will, uh, we will be excited to, to dive into it with, with Peter because I think he's coming at it from a slightly different angle. He, he's content, but... He's he's dabbling in this player I, I, performance I, side of things. It is a bit different for him, yeah. I think he's he it clearly has aspirations of of playing some competitive golf himself. Yeah. I think he's made a huge leap in in kind of the quality of his game. Yeah. I think he's always been a good player, but you can see it recently. Like when he's and Rick was saying the same thing. He's like, Pete plays like a tour pro at this point. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it'd be interesting to chat with him about kind of like what are his aspirations? Yeah. What does he want to, you know? create videos of is it more to do with playing is it more to do with equipment um but it's great it's great talking to different people with kind of different different yeah, goals nice. and different opinions okay boys enjoyed it as always um guys thanks so much for watching for listening uh we're really enjoying the podcast we hope you are too hmm. join us next time for episode six with peter finch all right